This presentation uh, discusses the paper on chronic tonsillitis and biofilms and looks at some of the new treatment modalities. Um, it was written by a team um, from the National Defence University of Malaysia, Swansea University, the University of Dundee and the University of the West Indies. I'm Judy McKim from Swansea University, speaking on behalf of the team. So, the importance of discussing biofilms and treatment in, in tonsillitis is because it is a really uh, important global health issue. So recurrent tonsillitis can be described as when an individual suffers from several attacks of tonsillitis per year, around five maybe. These recurrent infections are caused by microorganisms and often these create biofilms and a repository of infection in the folds of the tonsils. And because the tonsils um, are folded and, and are, act as a repository, um, this can then lead to chronic uh, tonsillitis. So in this review, we look at different treatment modalities, some of the advantages and disadvantages, and some new treatment options, which look at the biofilms themselves. So chronic and recurrent tonsillitis um, is a, a serious global health problem. It affects an awful lot of people, not just children, but adults as well. And it has large economic consequences, cost to the healthcare of providing antibiotics or surgery, but also the cost to the individuals themselves. It is more prevalent in children, um, leading to time off school and education, and of course a significant impact on the quality of life. So antibiotics have, have been used um, for many, many decades really, and they can provide temporary relief, but the tonsillitis often recurs, and this is primarily due to the biofilms and the, the antibiotics or the antimicrobials not getting to the, uh, the biofilm itself. Of course, in the past, surgery um, has been a treatment. Um, it's still used, but less so than it used to be. Um, but it does result in many complications. So biofilms themselves have been observed for hundreds of years, actually, since the 17th century, um, when Van Leeuwenhoek observed them. And biofilms are present in between 65 to 80 percent of human bacterial infections, depending on which studies you look at. Biofilms are systematized communities of microorganisms, and they're embedded in a hydrated matrix of extracellular polymeric substances. And this, to know this is important when we have to think about the treatments for addressing the biofilms. But they don't just cause tonsillitis, they cause diverse persistent infections, dental plaque, cystic fibrosis, urinary tract infections, ear infections, otitis media, osteomyelitis, just to name a few. Um, in tonsillitis um, itself, um, Kanye et al said that they looked at, in their study, at biofilms being reported in 70% of chronic tonsillitis patients. So biofilms, you know, do are widespread. Thomas et al put it in a nutshell, really, in this quote. Um, they pose a serious problem for public health because of the increased resistance of biofilm-associated organisms to antimicrobial agents and the potential for these organisms to cause infection also in patients with indwelling medical devices. So the resistance um, is, is important, not just in biofilms, but, but to you know, many, uh, many bacteria. But actually, um, the other side of things, looking at how these infections can, cause, uh, can be caused with indwelling medical devices, can lead to really serious infections like bone infections or perhaps um, devices in, in the heart or other areas of the body. So how do they form? Well, there are five stages. Some people describe four stages, but, but others as five. Um, so we've just, I've just picked out from the review just some of the, the references here. Thomas et al. study looked, uh, suggested that they, in the first stage, that the microbial cells attach to surfaces reversibly. So this is the point where if you catch um, the infection early enough before biofilms have been formed, then that infection can be eradicated, hopefully, if the right um, antibiotic is used. Then they move and to attach to services ir irreversibly. So they start then to attach, and, and this is where resistance to infection comes in. Uh, Fleming and, and Wingender's uh, paper discusses that quite well in the review. 
Then they grow into micro colonies. Um, Borley et al's work suggested that this can be tens of hundreds of microns in diameter. So some of the micro colonies are very, are, you know, are very widespread really. Um, and then the fourth stage is what happens is they grow into a three-dimensional configuration. This is where the biofilm is actually formed. Cells replicate and then we have this accumulation of the extracellular polymeric substances. Um, um, and Alkvist's uh, paper looked at that. The final stage then is where the bacterial cells detach from the biofilm and disperse and they can actually form new biofilms. Of course in the tonsils, in the folds, they can get into the folds. Um, and Holstudley's work uh, looked at that. So here are a couple of slides looking at the different, uh, different ways just to give a visual representation of the four stages there in this one. Uh, this one looks at the five stages. Um, again, you can see how the free-floating bacteria land on the surface, they aggregate and attach, they start to form the biofilms in stage three, then they have a mature formation and then bacteria fly off and actually can, can go form new colonies elsewhere. So when we look at the treatments then, we can see that they sort of combine the revival of some older techniques um, and then some of which use antimicrobials but also uh, some new treatment modalities and how this works is the different types of treatment attack and disrupt the biofilms at different stages of formation as we've seen on the earlier slides by understanding how that resistance is formed by the EPS and other newer um, treatments are looking at the immune response and actually helping prevent biofilms from forming and becoming resistant to antibiotics. So here are some examples of the treatments. These are described much more fully in the paper. Um, immunoprophylaxis and immunotherapy, and then a, a host of treatments that look at disrupting um, the extracellular polysaccharides by topical agents, uh, amino acid, norspermidine, bioactive enzymes, cytotoxic agents, for example, citric acid, uh, and then two which look at different things, pulsed electromagnetic fields and laser generated shock waves. And um, in the paper you'll read that this is especially useful for infected wounds and then antioxidant mediators. Um, also, um, traditional drugs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can actually help to reduce biofilm formation. And then other ways of looking at physical removal um, and one study looked at vinegar combined with brushing as being quite effective in certain contexts. So these are described in the paper. So in summary then, um, recurrent or chronic tonsillitis is a global public health issue. It can severely impair an individual's quality of life. And as we've discussed, these microbial biofilms are a major cause of reputed tonsillitis and other infections. We know more research is needed to develop new treatment strategies, but actually um, what I think the paper really highlights is that doctors need to be up to date with the research and the treatment of biofilms, not just use different antimicrobials or surgery, but actually thinking about the application of topical agents, physical removal of biofilms and other innovative treatments. I hope you enjoyed the paper. If you want to, any further information, um, please contact um, Professor Manuel Hack and here's his email. Thank you for listening to the presentation and I hope you enjoy reading the paper.